words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Lord, you know how tiny our minds are. I'm sure you made them that way for a purpose. And we ask that you would guide us so that our minds might be avenues to you and that our will might operate in the light of the knowledge that you bring to us by your presence with us. So we thank you for all of that and we just ask that you will suit the words and thoughts to each person's condition in ways that certainly outrun any ability of my own. And so we wait before your presence, and as we wait, we're going to talk and think the best we can and ask that you would override and direct everything to the glorification of your Son in our midst and of your kingdom forever. So we ask that in Jesus' name, amen. Jan helps us by putting up a word for the day, and the word for today is knowledge. Knowledge. And uh, knowledge takes a beating, but in the scripture it is absolutely central. You never find faith except in a context of knowledge in the scripture. And that's how it works in life. And so we will want to be directing attention to this in many ways, including some pretty stiff and formal definitions, of course, <laughs> because we really do need to try to be as clear as possible uh, when we are talking about things that are this important, of course. So uh, I've written a bunch of stuff up here on the board and I'll get around to it more or less and uh, I'll be putting up some things on the screen also here. We start with that, in case you can't see this. This is uh, one of the most important things is to understand who we are and why we're here. And uh, the enemy works over time to mess you up on this thought. And so I want to work with you for a few moments on that first statement. You are a never ceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Now, you have probably heard this before from me because I say it often, it's so important. I'd like you to think about that for a moment. You are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Now you see, even if you're dead in trespasses and sins, you are still a spiritual being. That's your nature, and you don't get out of that just because you have rebelled against God, if you have. You are a non-physical reality. And your world is very busy trying to convince you that things about you are all physical. And we talked about this some in last October uh, in trying to get the, the theology of it all straight. But we need to be able to affirm that. I am an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Have you been able to say that? I am. Let's try it together, and if it's forcing you, don't say it. Just listen, okay? I am an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Now, in the light of that, you have to put God 
and how you think about God. All human problems come from thinking wrongly about God. Directly or indirectly, they come from thinking wrongly about God. And you will know the story of the first temptation well, and you will understand that the form it took was getting Eve to think wrongly about God. And, and in particular, it was getting her to think that if she didn't do something God said not to do, she was going to miss out on something. That missing out is the form of all temptation. If I don't do this, I'm going to miss out on something. And the idea of God as having your interest always at heart is one that uh, we have to struggle to maintain. So how we think about God, uh, how we place Him in our minds is related to everything, whether we are in rebellion or at peace with Him, how we think about God. So we think of Him as positioning us as spiritual in substance, never ceasing in duration. And this last one is perhaps what is most likely to be left out, that we are ruling or creative governance in destiny. And uh, you want to keep that in mind that is what you are here for. You are here training for reigning. You are learning how to reign in life through abundance of grace, as Romans 5, 17 says. Abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness to reign in life through one, Christ Jesus. That connection now is... I'll be spending most of our time in this first hour on that connection. We reign through one, Christ Jesus. He's the one who brings us back. But then that extends into eternity. And we have this marvelous statement from uh, the Gospel of John. This is eternal life. Now, you know, you, you get more of what they're saying if you say, this is eternal living. Eternal life, life has been kind of drained and it's been postponed. Eternal, this is eternal living. That they may know knowledge. That they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Right? Eternal living is knowledge. Now, leaping ahead a lot, knowledge is basically interactive relationship. That's what it is, basically. We'll, we'll be uh, trying to spell that out as we go along. So now, if you've got that, then... Um, Here's some little wording that shows up in William Law's wonderful book, A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. And, uh, you know, he tells little, creates little scenarios in there, and this is a father speaking to his son. And he says, First of all, my child, think magnificently of God. Now, that's the first thing. If you're thinking about your rule of life, you may want to put that up there somewhere. Think magnificently of God. Magnify his providence. Adore his power. Pray to him frequently and incessantly. Bear him always in mind. Teach your thoughts to reverence him in every place, for there is no place where he is not. 
A good thing to do to start your morning is to say, God is here. God is here. And if you got that straight, things will go well. My child, fear and worship and love God first and last. Think magnificently of Him. Yeah. Now, of course, you do that, you will be caught up in worship constantly. And worship is the single most effective discipline against wrongdoing in the moment. Try worshiping and doing something naughty. <laughs> Try it. And uh, this is one of the interesting stages in life's way is the point where a person has grown, where they're living in the presence of God, and then they want to do something wrong. They really want to do it, and they take a little vacation from God. You know, just step out of, see, that, that's a part of the messed up condition of human beings. They do it. But they know they have to take a vacation. Uh, because if they stand in his presence, then the goodness of doing what he wants us to do uh, is overwhelming. So you learning to choose that and live that and get to the point to where you know you're not missing out on anything by doing what is right. That's progress. Now then, um, we have a lot to cover uh, today. Um, I do want to understand that the message that comes from uh, Jesus Christ restores this way of thinking about God, fills our mind with his goodness and greatness, and we learn to sustain that, and of course, we are upheld by grace in doing that. Now, if you, when you look at this from the viewpoint of not having made a lot of progress, you think this will ruin your life. What would your life be if you did that? See? So God allows us to progress slowly and gives us instruction and gradually teaches us how our life is filled with good things as we do this. Right? Whatsoever true, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is of good report, anything that, has, uh, that is honorable. Do you, remember, you remember Philippians 4, 8. Now that's, that's what becomes your mind. It, it, isn't, it isn't impoverished. It's enriched by thinking rightly about God. Because then every good thing falls into place. And there is much good, and God enjoys his own creation and thinks it's good. So now uh, I want to transition now to the fruit briefly, because uh, the fruit of the Spirit describes what your life is like from the inside when you are rightly occupied with God, when God has rightly occupied you. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so on. And uh, we didn't cover all of it. I tried to cover the first main parts. I think the other parts are really important, uh, but uh, they are not as central as the five parts that we did talk about. But now the question I want to raise and pursue with you today uh, has to do with the connection or relationship between salvation and spiritual formation. The connection between salvation and spiritual formation. And um, if you're looking at your notebook, 
Um, I have to straighten the pages out a little bit here because it says Wednesday, salvation as a life. That's right. That's what we're talking about in this hour. But you have to go to lecture six to get the outline for this hour. I somehow managed to get these inverted. So lecture six is actually lecture four, and that's the one we're going to be doing uh, in this hour, and we will come back to um, what is in your book as lecture six uh, in the next, I'm sorry, in this afternoon, this afternoon. So my apologies for that. Uh, I don't know how, you, ne you never know how you get things messed up, do you? <laughs> <laughs> but I did. And so if you would, please just make that little shift. And we are talking in this hour about salvation of a, as a life, and we're paying attention to Christology and atonement. Now, let me tell you why it is necessary to do that. The greatest barrier to spiritual formation as a plan that is followed by those who, in some way, profess allegiance to Christ is their view of salvation. The soteriology, to speak the theological language, creates a huge problem because the version of salvation that is presented has no natural connection to spiritual growth. And we must get into that today and try to help us understand salvation as presented by Christ and in the New Testament, and for that matter, in the whole Bible. Um, and that presentation is precisely salvation is a life, not an arrangement. Not an arrangement, it's a life. Now, the statements in the scripture are extremely clear. Perhaps the clearest of all is 1 John 5, 11, which says simply, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Where is this life that has been given to us? It's in his Son. So that's why, to use the big word, Christology is all important. How we think about Christ and his work. Uh, we, we have many statements about what Jesus does, uh, but uh, of course the favorite ones often uh, tell us the most and we're apt not to see their depth, John 3.16. God loved the world so much that he gave his son, sent his son into it. That was the incarnation. He sent his, how did he send his son? In the form of a baby that was born in a natural way. Uh, Mary was a witness to this uh, in her lifetime because there was long discussions about whether or not Jesus had a real body. And Mary was there to affirm that he did. You have a baby, you know, this is not a hologram or something of that sort. This is the real thing. And so God loved the world so much that he sent his son in order that those who put their confidence in him would not perish but have eternal, everlasting life. Life. Now you see, our way of reading that robs us of the meaning. Because we are apt to read John 3, the whole thing, as if it were about forgiveness of sins. 
not about forgiveness of sins. It's about life. See, when you, you read these, the context, Nicodemus came saying that he could tell God was with Jesus. That he could tell that. And the way he knew this was by the things that Jesus did. And Jesus instructed him that you could not see the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God was God acting with Jesus. I, I, I wish I had time to spend a lot of time just exposing this passage, but I'll have to go quickly because I want to get on to more of the meaning. The, Nicodemus was claiming to see God acting with Jesus. And Jesus knew his condition and knew that he was right, but for the wrong reasons. And he knew that Nicodemus could not see the kingdom of God. And he said, unless you have been born from above, that is to say, you have received the life of the kingdom, you can't see the kingdom at all. You can't see it. And then Nicodemus makes very clear he does not understand what he's talking about by immediately reverting to the natural birth. How can a person be born a second time, enter his mother's womb and so forth? Well, you know, he was just off over here in left field wandering around. And so Jesus says, now, no, you have to be born from above uh, if you are going to enter. Now, seeing is one thing, entering is another. And entering means you are now involved in what the kingdom of God is doing. So that's the same lesson, actually, as Matthew 5.20. Unless you go beyond the goodness of the scribe and the Pharisee, you can't enter. It's the same lesson as Matthew 18. Unless you repent and become like a little child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Hmm? So now, the Christology and the atonement depends upon you understanding passages like this. God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world, his only begotten son, into the world that people might put their confidence in him and receive eternal life. Salvation is a life. Salvation is knowledge that is interactive relationship. Knowledge is always based in interactive relationship. Now, if you have interactive relationship, then you can raise to a level of abstraction. A person who operates on brains, for example, will normally have some abstract knowledge, but if he or she is going to operate on your brain, you probably will want them to have had a little hands-on experience, maybe have seen a brain or two, right? And that's interactive relationship is where knowledge arises. And of course, you don't want to get too far from it because you'll just wander off into the abstractions. And that's what happens to many people when they get too much theology in their heads, is they, they're off into abstractions. But they're not interactively involved with what they're talking about. And uh, so it's important to know that it's through interactive relationship that we come to have knowledge that is ongoing. Uh, when uh, the book uh, in Genesis tells us that Adam knew his wife, it doesn't mean he read a book about her. You know. That was interactive relationship. Right? And that is one of the primary forms of knowledge uh, that we have of persons is personal engagement. Sexual intimacy is only one form of intimacy, but knowledge turns upon that idea of engagement. And when Jesus 
gives us this definition of eternal life. And by the way, this is the only one that I know of in the Scripture. Um, he is very carefully uh, giving us a description that will guide us when we come to think about Him and about what we get by our relationship to Him. And uh, it's really important to hang on to that. Now, life. Um, if I have gone over this previously with you, forgive me, but we need to re renew it. Life is self-initiating, self-sustaining, self-directing activity. That's the mark of life. When something that has been alive is now dead, that is what is absent. That's what is absent. When the scripture says that we were dead in trespasses and sin, that is saying we did not have this kind of life in relationship to God. Now it's true that only God has life in himself. So a cabbage plant or a snail or a person, they have life but it is relative. And God is the one who gives life to everything as 1 Timothy 6 tells us. Everything that has life, it receives life and is sustained in life by God. And I think it means everything. I think it means the cabbage plant would be dead if God didn't keep it working. Right? And now we have to think a great deal about life between now and tomorrow evening. So please try to get that idea. When, uh, uh, whenever God said to Adam and Eve, if you uh, take of the fruit of that tree, you're going to die. Well, obviously, biologically, they didn't die. They kept going. But they did die in relationship to God. Right? So what that meant practically was that everything they did that had been previously accompanied by God's action, now they had to do on their own. Apparently Adam didn't sweat before he fell. Right? How did he do what he did? Well, I think he spoke and God acted with him. I think the second Adam illustrates how the first Adam acted before he fell. And today we still say when we're, we're, we're talking about how we're doing, well, I'm cool. No sweat. See? You're not cool. That means you're grinding it out, right? You're sweating. <laughs> and that's life on your own. So um, this understanding of life now is absolutely crucial. A salvation is a life, and this life uh, is given to us from God. And if we break away from God, we lose the life from above. Above, remember, is not like the other side of the moon. Above is here. The first heaven is right here. Going back to some of the things we went over last fall. Now, it's really important to keep, the, keep those things in mind. We're trying to be more practical in this uh, retreat, but you can't, there's nothing more practical than knowing the truth <laughs> about things, and uh, so you want to hang on to that. Um, We lose the life that we should have in relation to God, and Christ comes to bring that back. Now, of course, God was working with people through the ages. He somehow, for some reason known to him, he selected Abraham, and he began to work with him. And Abraham becomes very famous, uh, and he's very big now. You know, 
we speak in uh, kind of uh, uh, purified terms on the campuses of the Abrahamic religions. Right? The Abrahamic religions are, of course, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Uh, and Abraham is, is, is very big. When, when we say, you remember that Lazarus, when he died, uh, or the poor man, uh, when he died, went to Abraham's bosom. And there was a conversation then between Abraham and the other guy. Um, that's a picture of how God chose an individual to be the conduit through whom Jesus would come and life would come to all of the nations of the earth. So God has been working. And uh, we were having a little talk at breakfast about the language that is often used in the Old Testament that is brought up repeatedly as a scandal uh, to Christians. I mean, how could God be like that? And Well, God was working with people who needed to hear from him and he was communicating with them in the best way possible to help them move forward in God's project of redemption, which would lead to Jesus Christ, who would say, now forget everything you think you know about God, and I will tell you what he's like. So Christ comes in that progression and situates life down in reality, and a major part of what he does is to pull Christ, pull God out of the context of Judaism that had ossified and had become an oppressive force even to the people of Israel. And if you watch Jesus then, you, you notice that he's always reaching out to the people who were outside. And they were not just Jews, but he was very careful to stay with the Jews because they were the prepared people. Nevertheless, the only two times that Jesus talks about the greatness of faith of someone he's dealing with, they were not Jews. Do you remember who they were? The Roman centurion and the Syrophoenician woman. And that was, he was just sort of holding the line as best he could to get done what he was trying to get done with a group of people who would then explode across the earth. And he would say before he left now, go to all kinds of people, all nations. Nations ordinarily means Gentiles, but basically it just means all people. Okay, so salvation is a life. Now, how do we run into trouble with this today? Um, if salvation is a life, spiritual formation is a natural progression. Of course, supernatural, but I'll drop the prefix because you understand that. A natural progression. What does life do? Life grows. Life grows. And that growth is laid out repeatedly in the scriptures, like, for example, uh, Romans 5, uh, Philippians uh, 2, uh, Colossians 3, and perhaps the, uh, I think, uh, Second Peter ordinarily is recognized as possibly the latest piece of writing in, uh, in the test, New Testament. And 2 Peter 1 has, the first chapter uh, of 2 Peter has this wonderful progression. And uh, if I can move along fast enough here, we must turn to that in a moment and look at it just so you get the idea. But the, the basic idea here is this. If salvation is a life from above, spiritual transformation is the natural result. So your soteriology is going to determine how you think about spiritual growth. This is spiritual formation, that's just language covering 
growing in grace. More and more of your life is being taken over by grace. And knowledge, yeah. Uh, 2 Peter 3.18 puts grace and knowledge together because actually they are the same sort of thing, a kind of an intersection. Knowledge is an interactive relationship. You remember what grace is? God acting in your life to enable you to do what you can't do by yourself. Right. Knowledge and grace go together. They're, they're natural accompaniments. So we have to think a moment about how we get in trouble with spiritual formation, which I uh, talked a lot about now, but if you go to our seminaries and most of our churches, you'll find that it does not have a home in the ecclesiastical framework at large. It's treated as a marginal interest of some sort. And there's some progress being made in this regard, but instead of locating it at the center of seminary education, for example, it gets parked over in some uh, distant parking lot, to use airport language. Uh, some program, they have a little program over here for it, but it's not, it, you don't tell the people who are training for ministry that this is the central reality. And I don't want to get carried too far away on that, talking about what turns up as the central reality, but you have to think about that if you're involved in a church situation or you're concerned about how the work of Christ is going in general. What is it that we really think is central? And uh, the theology of salvation goes with that because uh, the dominant theology of salvation in our culture, our religious culture, uh, is um, forgiveness of sins. And... Uh, then how do you arrange for that? Actually, that's the issue, because forgiveness of sins is a big deal, because what it means is you now come out of the position of rebellion. God is in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not attributing their sins to them any longer. Why? Because they have come out of the position of rebellion. And uh, if the issue is forgiveness of sins, then you have to struggle with all sorts of things like universalism, right? If Christ paid for the sins of the world and his death, then why isn't everyone saved? And so that's, that's where you have your, your uh, Calvinist uh, position, uh, the tulip position, the five points of Calvinism. One of them is limited atonement because it's kind of logical. If Christ died for the sins of the world, everyone is forgiven, right? So you get universalism out of that particular version of salvation and you have to rush up and put a little patch on. <laughs> oh, well, really it wasn't for everyone. It was just for the ones that God foresaw. Right? So. I guess that means that the beating that Jesus took, didn't, he didn't take some people's beatings. It, it just gets so awkward, you see, when you try to think that out. And, uh, and so you wind up trying to think about, well, how, how could the atonement be limited? And then you wind up, well, it could only be limited if God foreknew the ones that were going to be saved. And now then you're in real trouble. <laughs> and you're going to need some more patches. <laughs> now, let me be, be sure. Forgiveness of sins is important, but that is not what being saved is about. Right? So we have all of these wonderful old songs. There was a time on earth when in the books of heaven an old account 
notwithstanding, of sins all unforgiven. My name was at the top. There were many sins below. I went into the keeper and settled long ago. See? That's it. So now, how do you get that? <coughs> well, the idea is you believe the right things. You believe the right things. And so that's where in the Protestant tradition, they don't believe in the sacraments of the church saving you, but they do believe right belief saves you. And now then guess, who has the right beliefs? Well, I do. <laughs> I have the right beliefs. And so, if you would like to be saved, what should you do? You should accept my beliefs. You should line up with me because, see, so now the, the idea here is that just because you have the right beliefs, you assent to the truths of the gospel. And again, it, I, I, I always hesitate to go over this because it can be taken so wrongly. Listen, right beliefs are absolutely fundamental, but not because God likes you to have them. Right? And he, he looks down on your mind and says, oh, I see, yes. You believe in the deity of Christ. You believe the Bible is the word of God. You believe in the virgin birth. Right? Okay, I'll check that off. We transfer the credit. And now then, the merits of Christ replace your demerits. And when you die, they can't find any reason to keep you out of heaven. So they'll let you in. Now, forgive me for speaking half humorously about all of this, but you need to understand the two systems that are engaged here. One is salvation is life. How does belief function in that system? It puts you in touch with the realities of Christ and the kingdom and of God. That's what belief is supposed to do. Belief doesn't get you points. The function of belief is to integrate you with reality. Why does it matter if you believe in the virgin birth? I'll tell you. A world in which there is a virgin birth is a different world from one in which there is not a virgin birth. Right? It's a different world. It, it isn't a, you fight over the virgin birth, that isn't a little thing about, you know, who's intellectually right or who's acceptable doctrinally. It's, well, you know, you believe that Daniel was in the lion's den and survived, and the lions got lockjaw. Well, that isn't a little credit point you get. Oh, no, okay, they believe, they believe the Bible. No, no. A world where things like are described in the Bible happen is a different world. And you're going to be acting differently because you believe that. See? So it isn't just an academic discussion. Oh, are there miracles? Well, no, there are no miracles, of course, because science says things like that can't happen. And so uh, you will rush around and say, well, you know, the lions, a, a virus struck them. <laughs> a short-lived virus. So that by the next day, they were ready to eat the enemies of Daniel. <coughs> And so, so you rub your intellectual tummy and say, oh, that was so satisfying, a virus, <laughs> a virus. <laughs> ah, I don't have to believe that, right? So belief functions very differently on these two systems. On the one, belief is in effect a work of righteousness. And that's what many people don't realize how this comes to pass. But the idea is, because you have the right beliefs, God will forgive your sins. Now, you ask yourself, why in the world would he want to do that? Just because you had the right beliefs. 
I don't know. We say, well, it's a mystery, you might say. Or you might say, well, he just likes you to believe those things. Right? So he looks down and inspects your mind. Oh, that's good. No, see, it's belief integrates you with reality. Now then, that reality leads on into discipleship and spiritual transformation in a natural way. If you are over here on the mere forgiveness idea of salvation, there's no natural progression. You've got everything that you have to get, and the next stop of the train is heaven. On the idea of life as salvation as a life, you're on a progressive movement that shows up every day, every day. A wonderful minister up in Toronto, I enjoyed him so much. He said, when I got saved, I thought I had three things. I had a certificate that said I got in. I had a ticket for the trip. And I had a catalog where I could put in orders while I'm still here. And of course, he was talking about how he learned differently as who went along. So now, uh, where is Jesus in this picture? Uh, and here I want to be very careful because many people today struggling with these issues that I'm going over here in a rather light fashion, I hope you'll not be uh, deceived at how important they are, uh, many people are really troubled by this because they don't know how to position Jesus in salvation if he's not just a sacrifice for our sins. Well, actually, there's a lot of good things that we find in the scripture to help us with this. Um, 1 John uh, gives us language. 1 John 3, 14 through 15. Um, 1 John 5, 11. 1 John 5, 11, God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. We see that, so life is a gift that is through his Son. But 1 John 2, the second verse, he is the propitiation for our sins. He is the propitiation for our sins. A propitiation is a covering. It's a covering. And... Uh, that language is extremely important. Um, it's used in 1 John 4.10. He gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He is our covering. And that is, I think you can put it in terms of this, that when we are trusting Christ. He comes to live in us so that when God looks at us, he sees Christ. He is the propitiation. Now that propitiation is indeed, as Romans 3 tells us, the propitiation in his blood. You can't understand Christ until you follow him to the cross. And the cross represents the heart of God. He laid down his life. And that eventuated in the cross. Did Christ have to go to the cross? Yes, he had to go to the cross. Why did he have to go to the cross? Well, probably for a lot of reasons we will never understand, at least in this life. But he had to go to the cross to reach human beings. The only suitable meeting place for humanity and God is the cross. 
And there's a lot to be said about this. Uh, when you ask what happened in the cross, uh, one way of describing it is to say the best human beings on earth killed the best man who ever lived. Uh, you know, Jesus didn't wander off into the jungle and get eaten by a lion. And he didn't die of a heart attack in the garden. Why not? Because his plan and the plan of the Father was that human goodness would be revealed for what it is in the unjust judicial murdering of an innocent man, and not only an innocent man, but the best man who ever lived. The best systems, Roman law and Jewish religion, killed the best man to reveal the true nature of human goodness. And they planned that carefully, and Jesus knew what was going on long before it happened. He, as he said, no man takes my life from me. That's why you don't want to see Jesus as a victim. Everyone around Jesus in the passion story was a victim. They didn't know what they were victims of. Jesus is the only one that wasn't a victim. He was conducting the orchestra. And that's why he had to be careful about what he said, because if he had said two more words, Pilate would not have crucified him. He already had his wife on his neck. He never said a mumbling word, the old spiritual goes. Why not? Because his words are so powerful that if he had said more, he would not have been crucified. Well, I may be tweaking your concepts a little too much here, but uh, you can, we'll have a chance in a moment for you to straighten me out. Okay. <laughs> So we have, unfortunately, a misunderstanding of Jesus on the cross, which it was merely, he was merely there to suffer. Now, he went to the cross in our place. It is vicarious. It is substitutionary. He died for our sins. Don't turn loose of that. Hold to the fact. Don't worry too much about the theory. See, because in many quarters, what is actually preached as the gospel is a theory of the atonement, not the fact of the atonement. He died in our place. He suffered for sinners. If it hadn't been for sinners and his desire to save them, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. And there are many dimensions. And don't narrow it down to some one little thing that someone suggested is what happened. Just keep the fullness of the person. Remember, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That's the fact. Don't substitute a theory for it. If you substitute a theory for it, you will lose the living reality of Christ in the life of the believer. When you come to verses like God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not attributing their trespasses to him, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. When you see he is able to save unto the uttermost, those who come unto God by him because he ever lives to make intercession. Wait a moment. You mean he's not done in his saving work? No, he's not done. His saving work goes on. That was Hebrews 7.25 in case you want the reference. Okay. 
And that same, same chapter goes on right at the end to talk about how we should draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive help in the time of need. See, that's an ongoing thing. The mediation of Christ is still ongoing. He is the Savior. And we are saved by him coming into our lives and becoming central to everything that we do. So now when you go back and you look at verses uh, such as shows up in Romans 3, for example, very important to understand these verses. It talks about how the death of Christ um, made it possible for God both to be just and the justifier. Okay? Now, if you're going to work through this stuff I'm talking about, you have to work through that verse. How did Christ and his death, how did that make God just? And this is where we have an unfortunate picture of God that says God can only be just if he punishes everything. That being just is a matter of punishing. That's how people read that verse. He didn't let anything go by. Everything was punished. But the punishment that some people deserved was given to Christ. And that's how God was just. He made sure that everyone got punished, except there's a little substitution of punishment. Well, how are you going to understand that he may be just? What is God's justice? If it's not making sure that everyone gets the punishment they deserve. Now, I suggest to you that the answer is his justice is his love. And that his forgiveness comes out of his love, not out of making sure that everyone, that the beating fell on someone. If it wasn't on the people who deserved it, still someone got it. Now, folks, uh, uh, you've put up with me very well so far. And just let me say that many people's view of the atonement gives you a very bad image of God. A very bad image. It gives you an image of a God who never forgives. Never forgives. Where is forgiveness? It's in the love of God. Jesus coming and uh, living and dying, and it was, his dying was a necessity of who he was and how he lived. If you live like that, there will be people who'd like to kill you too. Um, but it was an expression of the love of God so that people could understand this and approach God through Christ. So what does Romans 8, 5, 8 say? God commends his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Now that's a part of the atonement. See, that's a part of the atonement. The atonement is Christ himself, the person of Christ. That's the atonement. He is the propitiation of our sins. He is the covering. And that covering is in his blood because his life is in the blood. That's the constant teaching of the scripture. The life is in the blood. That's why the Jews were forbidden to eat blood. Scotchmen have permission to have blood pudding. 
but no Jew would do that. And why was the blood important? Because the life was in the blood. When I try to minister, I routinely ask that God would cover me in the blood of Christ. The life of Christ is what I'm talking about. And the symbol of his life poured out for us is his blood, and it was real blood. But when he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you, he's not talking about his blood, he's talking about his life. We have to come back to that later. That sixth chapter of John is so important in all of this. Eating and drinking the substance of Christ. What does that mean? Well, it means him. <laughs> it means him. Unless you take it. And he goes on to explain that. And he, he talks about how you take him in through his words. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. Now he's responding to the horror of the Jewish people sitting around there saying, ah, yeah, ah, he eat his blood and ooh, ooh. Well, they were just shivering. He said, look, the flesh doesn't profit anything. The spirit is what matters. And the words that I speak unto you convey myself to you. That's why it's so important for us practically to take in the words of Christ is because they bring his substance with him. Uh, let me just try to summarize a bit then, okay? All right. Let's see if we can get it down to where it's rather simple. And it is this, Christology, atonement, who is Christ? He is the propitiation for our sins. How does that work? By him living in us. And how does that work? By us counting on him, relying upon him, living with him as the one who is developing us further and further along. That the atonement is Christ himself. Now that involves everything that he did, but it keeps us out of the position that the atonement is something he did that is detachable from him. See? That's where you get a version of the gospel that essentially invites people to believe something that he did, and if you're on the left, it'll be different from if you're on the right theologically. Um, but uh, it'll be some little teaching of his or some big teaching of his, uh, perhaps caring for the poor. Um, he cared for the poor. He's, he brought good news to them. Uh, and that's one of the marks that he gave you remember to the people who came from John the Baptist, that he was the one. One of the marks was that for, for once, the poor hear a good, good news. Right. Now what was that good news? Well, it was basically that they too could live in his kingdom with him. That being poor was no barrier because it was assumed in that day that if you were poor, you were out of the blessing of God. Nowadays, that's been inverted, where many people seem to think being poor is a recommendation, right? Because after all, Jesus said, blessed are the poor. He didn't, they don't understand. He didn't say that blessed are you because you're poor, but blessed are you poor also, right? So you can take the things that he said, beautiful things, and then that'll be your gospel, and that will show up in certain identifiable religious connections that I suspect you're all very familiar with from your life and your experience. And then on the right, you have that, well, the one thing was he took our punishment. And so our sins are erased. 
and you get a version of justification that is horrendously wrong. And it comes out of trying to teach this to children but misleading them. And you take the word justified and say it's just as if I'd never sinned. Never. That will never be the case. It will always be I have sinned. And the grace of God has claimed me as a sinner. I will never be an innocent person. I will always be a redeemed sinner. Now, why am I redeemed? Because I have put my confidence in Jesus Christ. Uh, Please don't miss that, because given all the other stuff I've thrown at you, you're apt to think that somehow I have missed that fundamental reality. The fundamental reality is trust Christ. But that means trust the whole person. If I trust Christ, that means I think he was right about everything. And if he says, love your enemies, I say, it must be a good thing because he said so. It must, be, it must be possible. Maybe I can do that. I need to learn. He will teach me. That's the natural progression of trust in Christ. I've got just a few minutes and I, I, I did want to go over that passage in 2 Peter. So if you turn to 2 Peter and see how this was viewed uh, in the early church. And, you know, Peter, and I'm prepared to just take it at its word that this is the second letter of Peter. Uh, I don't worry too much about those things uh, because at this point it has a record a historical record. And I wouldn't, it wouldn't matter to me that much whether it was written by a crow or something of that sort, you know. As the test of the scripture is what happens when you put it into practice. And now we have a long series of practices for this. This is a glorious statement. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you in the what? Knowledge. knowledge. What is Knowledge. Interactive relationship. So grace and peace be multiplied to you in the interactive relationship of God and of Jesus our Lord. Looks like John 17.3, doesn't it? Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the true no- the what, what? <coughs> knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature. Well, how do you do that? By your association with Jesus. See, that's, you become the partaker of the divine nature through him. Now, of course, the new birth is a, a moment in that, but then there's a life. New birth is not the place you live, it's the door. That you might become partakers of the divine nature, so now you're going to be an eternal being, right, with an eternal destiny and all of that having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, for this very reason, that is because this is what's been given to you, apply all diligence. Don't sit down and wait for God to do it. How much diligence? All diligence. In your faith, add moral excellence. Now, It's a good exercise. Most of you are teachers, and you can spell out each one of these as you go along. Add from faith. You don't start with moral excellence, right? You start with faith. Your faith is confidence in Jesus Christ that he was right. He had it all right. 
He makes all of the provisions. So moral excellence is a natural progression. And then moral excellence add, wow, third time around, knowledge. There's knowledge and then there's more knowledge. And in your knowledge add self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance, stick to itiveness. And in your per perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And your brotherly kindness, agape. All of these progressions wind up with agape. Colossians 3 says, And above all these things, put on agape, which is the bond of perfection. You don't start there, but you get there. And you get there by increments as you allow the Christ who is your covering to teach you and lead you and impart to you his kind of life. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, see it's a progressive sort of thing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true, what? In the true interactive relationship of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to read the rest of it. That's enough, I think. See, that's the picture of how atonement and spiritual formation come together. Let's say that again. This is the picture of...